He is called Editor from the continent of Europe, who in conversation confided to me an even more ideal secret for the American language. When I told him, among other things, that I had been the day before to Mr. Chatterlet's about the local language and had told him a little about the system, he replied, Do you know what, my dear doctor? As you are a subscriber to our paper over there, I cannot help revealing to you a certain secret of the language here. And he said further, Knowing several of our European languages, you can, by employing this secret of mine, be master of the language here to perfection, and indeed converse about anything you wish, and not simply make others think that you know the English language, for which purpose I do not deny the system of this Chatterlitz is indeed excellent. He explained further that if, when pronouncing any word taken from any European language, you imagine that you have a hot potato in your mouth, then some word of the English language is in general bound to result. And if you imagine that this same hot potato is furthermore well sprinkled with ground red pepper, then you will already have the pronunciation of the local American English language to a T. He advised me, moreover, not to be timid in choosing words from the European languages, since the English language in general consisted of a fortuitous concourse of almost all the European languages, and hence that the language contained several words for every ordinary idea, with the consequence that you almost always hit on the right word. And suppose that, without knowing it, you use a word entirely absent from this language. No great harm is done. At worst, your hearer will only think that he himself is ignorant of it. All you have to do is just bear in mind the said hot potato and no more baloney about it. I guarantee this secret and I can safely say that if, on exactly following my advice, your language here does not prove to be ideal, then you may stop your subscription. Several days later, I had to go to the city of Chicago. This city is the second in size on that continent and is, as it were, a second capital of North America. On seeing me off for Chicago, that mister, my New York acquaintance, gave me a letter of introduction to a certain mister there. As soon as I arrived in this city, Chicago, I went straight to this said mister. This Chicago mister turned out to be very amiable and most obliging. His name was Mr. Bellybutton. For the evening of the first day, this amiable and obliging Mr. Bellybutton suggested my accompanying him to the house of some of his friends, so that, as he expressed it, I should not be bored in a quite strange city. I, of course, agreed. When we arrived, we found there a fair number of young American beings, guests like ourselves. All the guests were exceedingly gay and very merry. They were telling funny stories in turn, and the laughter from these stories of theirs lingered in the room like the smoke on a day when the wind is south over the chimneys of the American factories where the American sausages, called hot dogs, are prepared. As I also find funny stories amusing, that first evening of mine in the city of Chicago passed very gaily indeed. All this would have been quite sensible and very delightful if it had not been for one feature of the stories told that first evening which greatly astonished and perplexed me. And that is, I was astonished by their what is called ambiguity and obscenity. The ambiguity and obscenity of these stories were such that any single one of these American storytellers could have given a dozen points to Boccaccio, famous there on the planet Earth. Boccaccio is the name of a certain writer who wrote for the beings of the earth a very instructive book called The Decameron. It is very widely read there at the present time and is the favorite of contemporary beings breeding there on all continents and belonging to almost all communities there. The following day, also in the evening, this kind Mr. Bellybutton took me again to some still other friends of his. Here also were a large number of young American beings, both male and female, sitting in various corners of a very large room, conversing quietly and very placidly. 
When we were seated, a pretty young American girl soon came and sat down beside me and began chatting with me. As is usual there, I took up the conversation and we chatted about anything and everything. She asked me, among other things, many questions about the city of Paris. In the midst of the conversation, this American, as they say, young lady, suddenly, for no earthly reason at all, began stroking my neck. I immediately thought, how kind of her. She must certainly have noticed a flea on my neck and is now stroking the place to allay the irritation. But when I soon noticed that all the young American beings present were also stroking each other, I was much astonished and could not understand what it was all about. My first supposition concerning the fleas no longer held good because it was impossible to suppose that everybody had a flea on his neck. I began speculating what it was all about, but try as I might, I could give myself no explanation, whatever. Only afterwards, when we had left the house and were on the street, I asked Mr. Bellybutton for an explanation of it all. He immediately burst into unrestrained laughter and called me simpleton and a hick. Then, calming down a bit, he said, What a queer guy you are. Why, we've just been to a petting party. And still laughing at my naivety, he explained that the day before, we had also been to a party, but to a story party. And tomorrow, he continued, I was planning to take you to a swimming party where young people bathe together, but of course all dressed in special costumes. When he saw that the same look of perplexed astonishment still remained on my face, he asked, But if for some reason or other you don't like such tame affairs, we can go to others that are not open to everybody. There are lots of such parties here, and I'm a member of several of them. At these parties, which are not open to everybody, we can, if you like, have something more substantial. But I did not take advantage of this kindness of this obliging and exceedingly amiable Mr. Bellybutton, because the next morning I received a telegram which made it necessary for me to return to New York. At this point of his tales, Beelzebub suddenly became thoughtful and after a rather protracted pause, sighing deeply, he continued to speak thus. The next day, I did not go by the morning train as I had 